Okay, everybody, why don't we get started on the next uh, session on elbow conditions. We're gonna have Dr. Eric Black speaking again first. Perfect, got it. Hello again, everyone. Um, so for those of you who I didn't uh, meet this morning, my name is Eric Black. I'm a shoulder and elbow surgeon out of Florham Park. And uh, I've been tasked today, where I'm gonna combine my two talks just for brevity's sake, and we'll talk about introduction to the anatomy and physical exam of the elbow and use that as a very quick segue into the most common elbow conditions that you will probably see as primary care physicians. I'll try to keep it very practical, just a couple of slides on each condition. What are the red flags? How do we manage this? What's your role as a primary care physician? And then when to refer as a specialist. So hopefully this will be high yield, and we, we're not gonna try to delve into too much nuance on this, because th this can be a pretty overwhelming topic, and the elbow is extremely complicated. So the bony anatomy of the elbow, from a simplistic view, there's three bones. There's the humerus, there's the ulna, and there's a radius. It's not a simple hinge joint, but it's about as close to the, that the body has to a hinge joint with some, with some modification. So there's flexion and there's extension, but then there's rotation. And there's multiple articulations. So there's where the humerus meets the ulna, where the ulna meets the radius, where the ulna meets the humerus, so, and the radius meets the humerus. So there's, there's three main articulations, and we can't uh, talk about the elbow without talking about all three of those articulations. The, the elbow has a natural valgus, what we call carrying angle. So if everyone looks down at their elbow and extends it, you'll probably find that some people's elbows extend and they hyperextend. Some people's elbows don't extend all, all the way. And then some people have more crooked and some people have more straight elbows. So everyone's a little bit different. So then the ligaments of the elbow, the two primary ligament complexes we talk about is the lateral ligament complex and the medial ligament complex. So on the medial side, which you could see on the right, that's when, when people finally refer to Tommy John surgery, that's where we're talking about the inner or medial side of the elbow, multiple bundles, pitchers, and overhead athletes, and we'll talk about that later on in another talk. Uh, then the lateral collateral ligament complex, the LUCL or the LCL, um, is where we'll see patients who have issues with instability, dislocations, we have conditions called PLRI or posterior lateral rotatory instability, and a lot of the times there's some overlap with tennis elbow, and we'll talk about what I call tennis elbow plus. So the muscle anatomy is very complicated, but I like to break it down into flexors and extenders above the elbow, and then flexors and extenders below the elbow. So the flexors, and, the flexors above the elbow are the biceps and the brachialis. The extenders above the elbow mainly is the triceps. And then we talk about the extensor group, which ex essentially extends the wrist below the elbow, and then the flexor group, which flexes and pronates the wrist. So all these muscle groups are kind of lumped into, I, I think they can be easily defined as flexors and extenders below and above the elbow joint itself. And what they act on is whether they act on the elbow or whether you actually have some wrist action as well. The nerve anatomy is complicated. There's lots of nerves. The elbow is a hotbed for problems. If you're trying to operate on the elbow, there's a lot of things that can get in the way and a lot of things that can get harmed. But from your perspective, the most important things to talk about are entrapment syndromes, which you will see about the elbow, which are the median ulnar and radial nerves, the most common being the ulnar nerve, and we'll talk about that. The vascular anatomy, so just two main points to consider. Most of the arteries are deep in the front, and then most of the veins are superficial kind of all the way around. So the most important artery is deep, the brachial artery, which bifurcates down low, and then the superficial veins, which is where we draw blood for. From. And so how do we examine an elbow? So the first thing we do is we look at it. So what are, is it inflamed? Is it swollen? Is it red? Um, what does it look like? And oftentimes the, the most important thing to identify is bursitis, and we'll talk about that swelling. Then I do a range of motion test. So what's the patient's range of motion? Is it seem normal? The typical range of motion is from zero to about 140, 145 in flexion and extension. And then I take their elbow and I, I put it at 90 degrees and I'll have them go palm up and palm down. And that's not the same as going palm up where you actually have their entire body rotate, you kind of want to isolate their elbow and I'll hold onto their elbow, make sure they're not cheating and really get a sense of their range of motion. And you can tell a lot from those simple tests. If they can't rotate their elbow, that's indicative of arthritis and we'll talk about that in just a minute. And then, yes, we touch patients too. So we palpate the inner part of their elbow, the outer part of their elbow, not like that. Um, and we palpate the posterior aspect of the elbow and we really isolate where they're tender. Um, and I think the most important part about a physical exam and a history about the elbow is to figure out what side or part of the elbow hurts and really then you can narrow it down to many of the problems. Is it lateral, is it medial, is it posterior, is it anterior? And by just making that little nuanced distinction, distinction, you can really eliminate a lot of problems by figuring out where it hurts. And then there's all these provocative tests which I'll go into um, with each of the actual problems that we're gonna talk about. But it depends on the location of the pain. So in general, we do resisted strength exercises. Does it hurt when you flex your elbow against resistance? Does 
Does it hurt when you extend your elbow against resistance or when you pronate or supinate or flex or extend your wrist? And do they have pain at the range of motion through the middle or do they have pain at range of motion at the extreme? So when you flex it deeply in flexion, does it hurt? When you extend it, does it hurt? And then I kind of palpate around and you ping on all the nerves. And there's this, this test called the Tinel sign, which is where you ping on the nerves, specifically the ulnar nerve of the cubital tunnel. And if they get electric shocks, that can be indicative of something as well. We're just switching to another talk. Give me just one second. Any questions so far? OK. So we're just going to skip ahead. OK, so we'll talk about uh, common uh, disorders and how we manage that. OK, here we go. So largely atraumatic, so there's going to be a separate talk on traumatic conditions. So I'll try to hit the, the, the most common five or six things that you're going to see. So epicondylitis, we'll spend time talking about that. Tennis and golfer's elbow. Elbow arthritis, how we manage that. Distal biceps tendonitis and distal biceps tears cubital tunnel syndrome, and olecranon bursitis. So I think these are the big five or six. So tennis elbow, lateral epicondylitis. Um, this is very important because you're going to see this plenty of times in the office as primary care physicians. It's an overuse syndrome, and it's the most common cause of lateral elbow pain. So patients come in, they say they have pain on their lateral aspect of their elbow. Our radar beam goes up. We start thinking about tennis elbow, but not necessarily. So uh, it's, it's commonly called tennis elbow, but probably 90% of the patients I see with tennis elbow do not play tennis. So it's more common in patients who uh, overuse their arms, laborers, even just patients who are regular um, John and Jane Q. Doe that will come in with lateral elbow pain, and they might not even be very active, and they can still have lateral epicondylitis. From a technical standpoint, we talk about this as an inflammatory thing. It's epicondylitis, but it's actually not an inflammatory condition. It's an osis. Um, it's, there, there's this technical buzzword that we talk about in orthopedics, angiofibroblastic hyperplastic degeneration, which essentially means that all these blood vessels come in, things get unhappy, things get degenerative, and then the collagen becomes very disorganized. So on the left, you could see this nice long con longitudinal collagen sheets. This is what tennis elbow looks like. It's a very diffuse disarray of unorganized collagen. So that tendon has bad vascularity, and that can lead to degeneration and tears. Um, so it's very common. So 1% to 3% of patients will develop it per year. Uh, men are about the same incidence as women, usually in patients over the age of 40, but not always. And usually they'll have a repetitive history of aggravating their wrist extensor. So it's not always an elbow thing. It's more of a wrist problem. The patients who are increased risk of that are smokers, manual laborers, racket sport athletes. And about 80% of patients, regardless of whatever kind of treatment you have, get better after a year. So most people get better eventually, not quickly, though. And if you look at patients who seek treatment, about 4 to 11% of them end up having surgery. So not everybody gets better, but the majority of people do. So what's the anatomy behind this? Um, on the lateral side of the elbow are the common extensors. So these are the muscles that when you take your hand and you want to extend your wrist, those are the muscles that are most affected. And that has something to do with how we diagnose this. So the extensor carpi radialis brevis, which is one of the muscles right over here that I'm circling, is the most common one that's involved. Um, and suffice it to say, though, that that's not an isolation. So these tendons and muscles can tear, they can get inflamed, they can get degenerative. But then there's a lot of other things in the area that can also cause lateral elbow pain. So we'll talk about the warning signs. So the history and physical exam, the patients will come in, oftentimes they have pain with gripping, twisting, opening jars, shaking hands. That's the biggest one. I can't shake people's hands in my office. It kills me every time I do that. They may or may not have an injury, oftentimes they don't. And the two most common physical exam findings you'll see, they have tenderness over the lateral epicondyle. So everyone take your elbow and feel where your lateral epicondyle is. It's that bony ridge right on the lateral aspect of your elbow. And then they'll have pain with resisted wrist and middle finger extension. I'll extend their elbow and I'll have them resist me. As I hold their wrist, I say, raise your wrist against resistance. And usually they'll shudder back and have pain. I'll typically do that with their elbow and extension. And oftentimes I'll move their elbow and they won't have any hyperlaxity, so no instability. So there's a spectrum of, of imaging. Um, X-rays can be helpful, but not always. most of the time they don't show anything. And an MRI can show something from what we call tendinosis, which is here on the lateral side of the elbow. You'll see there's some subtle irregularities to the tendon. There's a little white that comes in. Then you can see a small partial footprint tear where the, actually where the tendon is torn off the bone. And then you can actually have tears where the whole tendon tears off the bone, and it comes all the way down to the ligament complex. And these are very, very different animals in general. So what else could it be? So radial tunnel syndrome is generally uncommon, but it's where you can have compression of the radial nerve around the uh, muscles uh, distal to the tennis elbow. Oftentimes, patients with radial tunnel syndrome will have pain that's a little bit more distally. They can have more, more deep, aching pain that doesn't necessarily get aggravated with, uh, with motion or with stress. A plica, which is like scar tissue in the elbow, cervical radiculopathy, so nerve problems in the neck can cause pain down in the lateral elbow. 
Cartilage injuries are an osteochondral lesion. Distal biceps problems can cause pain in this lateral elbow because the bicep insertion is a more lateral structure than we think. And then ligament tears. So there's a lot of things that can cause lateral elbow pain. It's not just tennis elbow, so we have to be aware of that. So we should be aware of the difference between tendinopathy versus a tear versus a ligament pathology. This is the classic tennis elbow patient that you'll see a little bit of uncovering of the footprint. And then you'll see patients who have, quote unquote, they'll send, they're sent to you for tennis elbow. You get an MRI and their entire lateral ligament complex is completely torn off. And this is a whole different bag of worms. So how do we treat it? So just like anything in orthopedics I mentioned before, rest, avoidance of aggravating activities, anti-inflammatories, ice, massage, physical therapy, specifically eccentric exercises. So eccentric exercise doesn't mean you take a weight and you're going up and down all the way like this for three hours because that's gonna aggravate the heck out of your elbow. What an eccentric exercise is when you're doing wrist extension, what you do is you actually take the wrist and you help it extend and then you take a, like a two pound weight in your hand and then you, you flex, or excuse me, you, uh, you flex against resistance. So you don't extend against resistance you flex against resistance. So you're letting that weight drop down. So I call it lengthening as you're strengthening. So eccentrics are key, and you probably heard a lot about that yesterday in the Achilles talks. It's very helpful for tendinopathy. There's a couple studies out there that look at counterforce braces, these tennis elbow braces. And if they're worn all the time, 24 seven, pretty much with everything except eating, bathing, dressing, they, they're effective. There's been a couple of studies that recently came out that show they can actually work well, but they have to be worn properly and they have to be worn all the time. So that's the caveat. Cortisone, be very careful of cortisone for tennis elbow. Cortisone can cause more harm than good many times, so I tend to be very careful about the patients I select for cortisone. Almost nobody that sees me the first time in the office with tennis elbow gets a cortisone injection. So what are the alternative treatments? So, uh, so Will Sadie talked about PRP and shockwave for tendinopathy. There's, there's, a, there's like, I mean, you could spend an entire day talking about PRP for tennis elbow, but just to summarize, it's probably effective if it's done well and if it's done in the right patient. It's probably more effective than cortisone, but it takes a long time to work. So in, in tennis elbow, that's probably where the best data is for PRP, but even still, there's a lot of conflicting studies out there. And then there's these other things called shockwave, needle tenotomy, they're more or less the same. They're, they're no better than PRP and probably not so great for a lot of patients, but it's just something to try to feel like you're doing something. The literature is all over the place, so that's a whole other talk unto itself. I think probably PRP has the best evidence. The rest of the stuff is okay, but not great. And then surgery, at least in my practice, is reserved for patients who have had pain for six to 12 months. They might have a full tear on their MRI, and then we can do open debridements. Uh, we can, I, I like to repair the tendon back down to the bone, but there's a lot of ways that this can be fixed, and there's a lot of nuance to that. But generally, it takes a while to heal. Patients often have to wait about four to five months after surgery before they get their full recovery. So as PCPs, what, what, what's the best way that you, we can manage this? In general, I think if someone comes in with lateral elbow pain, they have normal x-rays, their physical exam is consistent with epicondylitis, and they have no warning signs, and I'll put a slide up for that in a sec, thoughtful rest, anti-inflammatories, send them for physical therapy, try a counterforce brace, and make sure that they wear it right, and there's a lot of different videos you can show, that you can show them on what different websites that show them how to wear it properly. Give them a home exercise program. Maybe try one cortisone injection if all of these fail, and then plus or minus an MRI and a referral. If the pain continues for more than six to 12 weeks, I would generally have them see a specialist. What are the warning signs? If they injure their elbow and they have acute lateral elbow pain, if they have clicking, clunking, popping, catching, locking, if they have severe weakness on their exam, if they have any neurovascular compromise that seems fishy, if their x-rays show any calcifications or any displays or anything unusual, or if they have a palpable mass, I think you should, those should probably be referred out. So medial epicondylitis, very similar in terms of the general principles, so we'll kind of fly through this one, but it's different in that it's called golfer's elbow, and it's a tendinopathy of the common flexor origin. That's much less common than tennis elbow and really only probably represents about 10 to 20% of the epicondylitis spectrum, and it's a non-inflammatory pathology. So the anatomy is a little different in that the medial epicondyle uh, has a bunch of muscles, and then there's also a nerve, the ulnar nerve or your funny bone nerve that comes behind it. So generally it's more responsible for what we call flexion and pronation. So history and physical exam. So similarly, they have medial pain of the elbow. It radiates over the epicondyle down to the forearm. Insidious onset, they have tenderness over the medial epicondyle. And pain with resisted flexion, gripping, and pronation. So instead of extension, I'll have them resist flexion and pronation with the elbow extended. So I'll put my hand here. I'll say flex against resistance. And usually, they'll complain of pain right over the medial epicondyle. And then they, generally, you don't want them to have nerve symptoms or normal range of motion. So again, the spectrum can be from small little micro partial tears to huge tears of what's called the flexor pronator mass. 
Uh, the differential diagnosis, so cubital tunnel syndrome, nerve entrapment, and we'll talk about that in the next one. Um, ulnar nerve instability, if they have clicking back here, you can sometimes feel that their ulnar nerve will subluxate around the medial epicondyle. Do they have a ligament injury? Do they have arthritis? Do they have radiculopathy? That's the most you know, common thing with nerve problems. You can also have a nerve problem in your neck. And do they have a triceps problem? So how do we treat it? Similar. Rest, avoidance of, of activities, anti-inflammatories, ice, massage, again, physical therapy with eccentric exercises, counterforce bracing, and again, very wary of cortisone. Uh, in golfer's elbow, there's a lot less written about it, so PRP might help, but there's not as much of encouraging data about that, so we, we tend to be very careful about the, the way we treat it alternatively. And again, um, surgical intervention where you repair the tendon back down to the bone in some way, shape, or form is ultimately the, the treatment if everyone fails conservative treatment. So again, this is pretty similar. Uh, you could find this on your PowerPoint presentations that you were given. So uh, warning signs, acute injury, again, mechanical symptoms. Do they have severe weakness, numbness, nerve snapping? Do they have neurovascular problems, laxity to the elbow, or a palpable mass? I think that's a reason to refer out. So elbow arthritis. So elbow arthritis comes in many shapes or for and forms. So there's three main etiologies. There's osteoarthritis rheumatoid arthritis, and post-traumatic arthritis. And a lot of the treatment that we do depends on how chronic it is, how much it bothers them, what the etiology is, and the vast majority, overwhelming majority of elbow arthritis is treated non-surgically. As I said before, we don't walk on our hands and elbows and shoulders, so we can often treat most of this uh, well without surgery. So osteoarthritis is the most common form it's degenerative, idiopathic, mostly in males, mostly in middle-aged laborers, and typically the patients will present with osteophytes capsular contracture. Doc, I can't move my elbow. It's only moving from here to here. That's an arthritic elbow more often than not. They get contracture, stiffness, locking, clicking, popping, all the stuff that typically can happen with arthritis. Progressive stiffness, pain at the end range of motion. You try to stretch them out, it won't go. They have a flexion contracture. And oftentimes these patients will also have cubital tunnel or ulnar nerve problems. We get x-rays, the x-rays show this classic pattern of osteophytes in the front and the back, loose bodies floating around the elbow, um, and cartilage narrowing. So what's the treatment? So similar to mostly everything in orthopedics, again, you're seeing a theme here, anti-inflammatories, rest, physical therapy. I'm more liberal about cortisone injections with elbow arthritis, and then when we move to surgery, there's arthroscopic interventions, open interventions, and rarely, rarely, rarely for osteoarthritis nowadays are we doing total elbows. So the days of total elbows are extremely uncommon, and me as an elbow specialist, I probably only do about two or three a year, and those are mostly on fractures, quite frankly. Contrast this to rheumatoid elbow. This is, this is completely different. These are patients who, so, so rheumatoid elbow is the most commonly uh, seen inflammatory arthropathy in adults. You'll typically see bone resorption, osteopenia. The elbow looks like it's exploded on the inside. They have very significant ligament destruction, and they have very floppy, unstable elbows. Typically, these patients don't just have pain at the end range. They have pain at rest, and they have a very swollen, deformed-looking elbow. Very, we call it moth-eaten bones on the x-rays. And they typically have pain at the mid-arc. So osteoarthritis have pain at the end points, and rheumatoid arthritic patients typically have pain in the middle when you move them around. And the treatment is, is very kind of shifted towards our rheumatology con uh, colleagues, and most of these patients are effectively treated with medications only, the occasional cortisone injections, and then sometimes we'll go in and, ta and do an arthroscopic synovectomy. And again, rarely have I seen this necessary because DMARDs are so effective, but total elbows are something in our armamentarium if we need to. Post-traumatic arth arthritis, that's a whole other bag of worms, prior surgeries, prior fractures, prior injuries. Usually we have to treat these patients a lot more aggressively, so we don't need to worry about that. Distal biceps tears. So it's usually a distinct injury with eccentric force to the elbow. Someone's holding something, they get a force in their elbow and they feel a pop, and next thing you know, their elbow will, their bicep will roll up into their arm and they'll get all kinds of bruising and swelling. Uh, the risks, you, almost always, of all the hundreds of distal biceps tears I've treated, I've never treated a female with distal biceps tears, although it's been described. Um, oftentimes these patients will be taking anabolic steroids, they're smokers, and they, they may have had weakening of the tendon from chronic overuse. So on the history and their exam, um, often but not always, they'll feel a palpable pop and they'll have pain and weakness with resisted supination. So this is one of the most common misconceptions I hear when I talk to primary care physicians, but their biceps seem really strong. So this is actually, when you flex your elbow against resistance, that, that is testing the majority of the brachialis muscle. The brachialis muscle is a muscle that attaches to the humerus and to the ulna. The, the muscle testing that tests the distal biceps is resisted supination. So if you have your, the patient sit there and you have their palm up and you say, I'm going to try to turn your palm down, you keep your palm up, that's resisted supination. If they have a bicep problem, they will have weakness. 
they will almost never have appreciable weakness on resisted flexion. That's a really important distinction to make with patients who have biceps problems because they'll typically have weakness on supination and not flexion. And then there's this test called the hook test. That's very reliable. You can actually, if you want to try it on yourself, make a bicep muscle and take your finger and try to hook underneath your bicep tendon. If you could feel your bicep tendon, it hasn't torn. If you can't feel it, the bicep has about a 98% chance that it's torn. So that's a very reliable test. Someone comes in, you feel a pop, you say, let me try to like ping your biceps with my index finger. You can't feel it. All of a sudden, that's, a, that's an automatic referral. These patients oftentimes will get MRIs and you'll see the bicep will tear off the bone and curl up into the arm. So how do we treat it? Probably about 99% of patients with distal biceps tears, especially more young active patients, are surgical candidates and we reattach the, the biceps in some way, shape, or form down to the, uh, down to the arm. So cubital tunnel syndrome is the most common compressive neuropathy at the elbow. It's a compressive neuropathy of the ulnar nerve. It's oftentimes a progressive problem. And it's probably the second most common compressive neuropathy, carpal tunnel being the first, and we have a whole lecture on that later. Um, so the causes, there's lots of different uh, causes, idiopathic, repetitive overuse, anatomic variations on the cubital tunnel anatomy, um, or nerve instability. The anatomy is very important because the, the ulnar nerve sits behind this bone called the medial epicondyle underneath a ligament called Osborne's fascia, and it can get compressed. And oftentimes when patients come in with cubital tunnel syndrome, their main complaint is that they have numbness down their forearm and pain, and they have numbness to their, to their uh, little finger and to their ring finger. The physical exam is classic for what we call the elbow flexion test. If you flex their elbow and you kind of leave it there, and you ping their ulnar nerve, which is right behind the medial epicondyle, they'll get zings and tingles, and their elbow will feel like it's being electrocuted. Um, and then sometimes you'll actually feel the ulnar nerve is unstable in the groove. If you start seeing this, that, that means that the cubital tunnel ha is far gone. If you start seeing patients with weakness to their hand, uh, weakness specifically of their interosseous muscles and their uh, thumb adductors, so oftentimes they'll do what's called a froment sign, which is where you have patients grab a piece of paper with both of their thumbs. If one of them, if their thumb ends up flexing, that means they have weakness of their adductors, and oftentimes that, that will indicate advanced ulnar nerve pathology. Imaging, it's almost always normal. We rarely get MRIs, but oftentimes we'll get an EMG study to quantify how damaged the ulnar nerve is. And the differential diagnosis is important. If you see someone with numbness and tingling down their arm, you, we have to be wary of cervical radiculopathy, so nerve compression at the neck. Um, there's a huge component of overlap between um, ulnar, or ulnar nerve problems and cervical radiculopathy. And then again, we talked about medial elbow pathology, so ligament instability, nerve compression. Systemic neuropathy is another big one. If someone has numbness, that doesn't mean they have a compressive problem. They can have a neuropathy, such as with diabetes or more systemic neuropathy. The treatment in the early phases, I'll give patients anti-inflammatories and I'll tell them I want them to buy an elbow sleeve that they could sleep in. So if you sleep with your elbow extended, it tends to put a lot less pressure on your ulnar nerve and a lot of the times the ulnar nerve symptoms will go away, especially if it's early on in the cubital tunnel spectrum. Once it becomes more chronic, more persistent, this oftentimes does not work and um, surgical release with, uh, with moving the nerve can oftentimes be indicated and that's very effective in in treating the uh, disease and preventing progression more than anything. So when to refer. So if a patient comes in, they have numbness in their fingers, probably more than six weeks. They've been unresponsive to steroids, anti-inflammatory, stretching, splinting, or if they have clawing or atrophy in their hand or early weakness and they feel like their hands are clumsy and they can't move, that's probably a good indication to refer. So finally, olecranon bursitis. So olecranon bursitis is an inflammation of the posterior fluid line sac in the back of the elbow that overlies the olecranon, and it lubricates the skin over the bone, so the skin doesn't stay completely attached to the bone. So it's very superficial, it's susceptible to trauma and lacerations. And I think the hardest part is figuring out what kind of olecranon bursitis is. So some, I'll, I'll see a lot of patients that come in with olecranon bursitis and they've been put on antibiotics in some way, shape, or form. And probably the most common type of olecranon bursitis is just inflammatory. Um, and it's acute or chronic, and it's almost never associated with an infection. So patients will be put on antibiotics just as a precautionary measure, but we have to be careful there because you don't want to overtreat uh, uh, quote unquote infections. So infections are usually uh, with lacerations or some sort of trauma, but not always. And then we have to think of gout as well. So people with gout can oftentimes have a rip roaring olecranon bursitis that mimics an infection. So how do we examine these patients? So we take a history, we figure out is it a traumatic thing? Have they have a history of a draining wound on the back of their elbow, like you see on the top one? We have to be mindful of tenderness, fluctuance. We examine the triceps because oftentimes there's a lot of overlapping pathology with the triceps and the olecranon bursa. And we really you know, test their skin, make sure that we see if there's proximal erythema, if there's signs of concern for an infection, then, then we can treat that as such. Um, X-rays can sometimes show these big bone spurs on the back of the olecranon, and usually there is a complex fluid collection at some point, so I won't run to get an MRI uh, unless someone's failed some conservative treatment. But if you're concerned about an infection, sometimes people will get an MRI to see if there's soft tissue erythema or, or swelling tracking proximally and distally. 
So how do we work these up? So um, with aseptic lecronombrositis, rest anti-inflammatories, compression sleeves, either neoprene sleeves or something they can get over the counter are very helpful, and then I'll aspirate them and inject them with cortisone. If there's a suspicion for a septic lecronombrositis, I will not inject with cortisone, but I'll start them on empiric gram-positive uh, antibiotic therapy, and I'll do an aspiration, and we'll send it for culture, fluid analysis, crystals, because if it's positive for crystals, it'll present like an infection, but in reality, the patient should be treated for gout, and, and I'll follow them up very carefully, usually at like five to seven days after that to make sure they're responding to whatever treatment you give them. Um, aspiration injection, this is one of the most common problems I see when patients are referred to me with recalcitrant olecranombrositis is uh, someone will inject the back of their elbow right in the real soft spot in the media area in the back of their elbow and with an 18 gauge needle and then they develop a persistent draining sinus. So when you aspirate an olecranon bursa, I tend to sneak through the back, I do a zigzag approach right by the triceps region because it tends to not leave an area that will continually drain when all the fluid wants to drain out. I think that's important because if someone has a persistent draining sinus, that will require surgery unfortunately. And then again, if you're concerned for infection, always send for culture, crystals, cell count. Uh, and then surgery is a pretty last line treatment when you do an electron and possibly fix the triceps, and that's just for patients with very recalcitrant symptoms. That's very, very uncommon that that's necessary. So when to refer? Uh, recurrent inflammation, despite drainage, cortisone, compressive sleeves. If they have a recalcitrant infection, a chronic draining sinus, if they've been unresponsive to antibiotics, either, either PO or then IV, sometimes we'll have to admit patients to the, to the hospital for IV antibiotics if it's really severe and they get serial aspirations. Uh, or if there's evidence of osteomyelitis on an MRI, that's a big problem. Um, and uh, obviously if there's concern for a tricep tear as a result of the swelling in the back, that's concerning as well. Thanks, that was a huge overview and thanks for your time. Yes. So for tennis elbow and golfer's elbow, when you're doing an injection, it's a peritendinous injection. So you're injecting at the tendon insertion. And there's, there's a number of studies out there that look at patients' risk factors for poor or good success, either surgical or non-surgical. And they've basically stratified patients who have had two or less injections they generally do okay, and the injections probably don't hurt them. But if you have three or more injections, even over the lifetime of your elbow, whether it's spaced four years apart, patients can have significant long-term problems with their elbow. So we have to be very careful of injections in that peritendinous area. When you, the question was, what's the difference between tennis elbow injection and an elbow arthritis injection, where we're more liberal about injections? When you're injecting for elbow arthritis, you're injecting intraarticularly in the joint, not around a tendon. So it's a little bit of a different animal because the cortisone spreads throughout the joint, and it's not isolated to the tendon area. So you tend not to have as many secondary problems with the tendon insertion itself if you're injecting the joint. Yes, question in the back. So how much volume and what do I use for the electron bursa injections? Um, usually I will do one cc of lidocaine and 40 milligrams of Depomedrol. Yes. So the, the, the question was complications with too many tennis elbow injections. So the, the most common complications you'll see that aren't really critical, patients will have skin uh, fat wasting underneath their skin. So especially skinny, slender patients who have a little bit of fat, the, the, the cortisone will necrose the fat cells and they'll get a huge divot on the under, uh, right on the lateral part of their elbow. You can get skin bleaching because the cortisone is so close to the underlying dermis that it'll actually bleach the dermis. So patients will show up with these big white spots on the lateral aspect of their elbow. And then if you have too many cortisone injections to that area, it can cause further tearing of the actual tendon insertion itself, and the tendon becomes more fibrotic, almost like a rubber band that you have sitting in a drawer for about you know, a year, and then you kind of pull on it, and it falls apart. That's what can happen to the tendon with too much cortisone. So the complications in that study, though, were patients just, their outcomes were not as great after surgery if they've had three or more injections uh, long-term. They just didn't have as much pain relief function of their elbow. Okay, thanks very much.